We're back and welcome to a new podcast. Today, as you can tell, we're in a little bit of a different place. Audio viewers, behind me I have a lamp. In front of me I have an unopened wine bottle. There's a sign that says eat and drink right next to a tea kettle. I'm not in the same place I was last time because as I've told you before, my life is on the road. So this podcast, we're going to be doing it a little bit different. I am going to be having a nice adult beverage. So I have a 2001 Bordeaux that has a twist lid because I forgot to bring my own wine opener, which is a new mistake. Always bring your own wine opener. I'm pouring this wine into a glass that has a bunch of ice cubes in it. And then I have some San Pellegrino orange. And that's what I'm gonna have. While, cheers! While I tell you a story. Mm, that's delightful. So, today I'm gonna tell you a story on how I let Paulo Coelho decide where I was going to travel. For those of you who don't know, Paulo Coelho is a very famous author. He wrote a bunch of books, and I've probably read most of his books minus like two or three. Ugh, let's take off some clothes. If you match my videos up to my wardrobe, you can probably guess which video I filmed today. Um, audio listeners, go check out my YouTube because my YouTube channel has actually me folding my scarf on it. Um, I was actually out videoing earlier today for about 12 hours, so if I seem a little bit tired or if I look tired, that's why, because I've been filming for 12 hours. Anyway, so I'm going to tell you the story of Paulo Coelho. So Paulo Coelho was an author, and he wrote many books. One of the books that he wrote that he absolutely loved but no one else loved at the time, was called The Alchemist. Now, if you're listening to this today, I'm certain you've heard of The Alchemist. Everyone has. Everyone knows The Alchemist. But it took years for The Alchemist to actually pick up and become what it is today. So I find that fascinating. You know, as someone who likes to write, who likes the art, who likes to create, one of his most loved books that he wrote himself didn't really take off. So then fast forward a bit, now the book's popular, it's published in hundreds of different languages, maybe not hundreds, a bunch of different lang languages. And then we have me, a very young adult trying to figure out my way in life, a little bit lost and a little bit trying to just, I don't know, do whatever you're supposed to do, find my own path. I knew the path I was on wasn't right. So I go into a bookstore, you know, and I'm looking at all of these books and the alchemist just pops out at me. It was this really cool version of it. Like they did the binding really cool and the paper's really cool. So I bought it. Went home, very similar to now. I had some sparkly water, mixed it with some cheap wine. And I opened this book and I read, and I read, and I read. And the alchemist is about the story about this man who's a shepherd, a shepherd in Spain. And he suddenly has a vision, and the vision is to go find the love of his life somewhere in Africa. So he's like, but I have my livelihood. I have my sheep. But there's something else out there for me. There's love. So he gets rid of his career, and he goes down into Africa, and he starts in the Sahara. He meets this tribe of Bedouin and Berbers, and they take him across the Sahara. They find this oasis. And they meet, they, they meet the love of his life. He sees, he sees the love of his life. And then he's like, no, in my vision, I went all the way to the pyramids. I have to go to Egypt. And I don't know why my, my uh, recording thing is doing this. Like, I'm not putting these emojis on the screen, you guys. Audio listeners, randomly, uh, there's emojis that pop up on my screen. I think it's pretty fantastic. Also, if you hear a car alarm, that's because we're in a city and there's car alarms here. So, haha, perks of not having a bougie recording studio like all of the other travel vloggers do. Anyway, so Paula Coelho goes out to Egypt. He sees what he wants to see. And then he's like, but I don't think the treasure I was supposed to find during this trip was actually in Egypt. I 
think it was at that oasis. And so he books it back to that oasis and his guides are like, yeah, you, she may be gone. That oasis may not be there. But then I don't remember if he finds the woman again or not. Like in my head, I was already, it did something in me. And I was like, I need to go find something in the world to figure out what is in purpose for me. So fast forward to when did I go to Morocco? I went to Morocco in 2019. So I had done a lot of research on how to get to Morocco. I mean, my entire life, as you know, I've solo traveled. Morocco was a little bit of a challenge for me because it was the first time I had been to a Islamic country. I wasn't sure of the rules. I wasn't sure if I needed to dress differently. I wasn't sure of like the Western stuff and all of that sort of stuff. So I'm like, you know what? Let's just do it. And I'll figure it out when I get there. So I book a plane ticket to Casablanca. And I spend a couple of days in Casablanca. And it probably was the worst experience of my life. Now, I was staying along the seaside. And I didn't realize there's a massive disparity of wealth in Casablanca. So in Casablanca, um, there's the section of Morocco that you would think of when you think of, a, you know, not a super wealthy country. The challenge, though, is that Morocco is a massively wealthy country. I was staying at the intersection of the not so rich part of town and the rich part of town. And this is where all of the nightclubs were. Because in the super rich part of town, no one wants to be annoyed at 4 a.m. with boom, 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 boom. In the uh, not so rich parts of town, who cares? You're going to complain anyway. Like, you're not going to go and complain. Like, that's just... It's a very different way of thinking. So I didn't know this hotel had a nightclub in it. And as I do everywhere I go, you know, I get up in the morning, I do my little hotel workout, and I'll do a whole podcast on what I do for my uh, my living routine in hotels to stay fit and healthy. But I did my little hotel workout, opened the window, and the nice sea breeze blew in. And then I went out on my exploration for the day. In my exploration, you know, I usually walk about 20 or 30 kilometers in a day. So I'm heading out walking and I run into this massive mall. Now, it is the richest mall I've ever been in in my life. Like security guards at the doors, at the beginning of every shop. Brands I don't even know the name of. Like I'm, Louis Vuitton is the only one I remember. But it was that was like the low level brand. And I realized that that was not the shop for me. So I finish my exploration around Casablanca, go to some markets, um, go to the most amazing mosque. I'll go to the mosque and then I come back to the hotel and it's, I don't know, five or six o'clock. And before I got to the hotel, I went to a grocery store because I really wasn't feeling like eating in a massive hotel with a bunch of people. I just wanted like a salad and go to bed because I was tired. So I did that, I ate my salad, went to bed and around 10 p.m. boom 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 and I'm like this was a five-star hotel that had such good reviews when I booked it go downstairs to the front desk and I'm like it's so loud and they're like oh yeah it's the nightclub come on down and I'm just like no I want to sleep and so they're like oh well it'll be over at 4 a.m. and I'm like but I have a flight that leaves at 6 a.m. I need a little bit of sleep. Um, you know, I had already been at Casablanca a couple of days. So this is like, you know, it was good for a couple of days. And apparently the nightclub was only open certain days. So after a while, um, they ended up moving my room to the other side of the hotel. And I ended up getting this whole suite. Like I had a bathtub with jacuzzis. I had a whole patio. I had like two massive king size beds, a sitting room. It was beautiful. So I stay in there for a couple of hours and then get up the next morning, get to the airport, um, and I'm checking into the airport, and I'm headed out to a place very, very, very far east in Morocco. Um, so I wanted to go to the Sahara Desert. Paulo Coelho, in his book, his main character went to the Sahara Desert, and I'm like, you know what, let's do it too. I've always wanted to see the Sahara and Apollo Coelho was inspired enough to write a book about this. I need to see it. Find time.
I don't know if ice was a good idea during a podcast. And we'll see if I keep this part in or cut it. <laughs> because it's kind of embarrassing. Anyway, okay. My crunching ice is over. So, it's a... How long was it to this airport? I don't know, maybe a two-hour flight, hour and a half flight. Um, and we're in a little plane, so it's a two on one side and then two on the other side. So we get into this little airport and we land, and it has one gate. And, you know, it has the duty-free right after the gate. So I'm like, okay, well, this is a very local airport where even locals buy the duty-free stuff. Um, everyone in there is loading up on cigarettes. Now, I was staying in the Sahara Desert, and I had communicated with the people that I was staying with. And they organized a taxi for me. And they're like, okay, so when you land, your taxi person will be waiting for you there, and then it's like 15 kilometers to our place. And I'm just like, awesome. So by the time I landed, it was, I think it was around 4 o'clock. And I was tired, you know, tired from the night before. I was hungry. I was thirsty, kind of had to pee. But I'm like, you know what? It's 15 kilometers. I can hold it. I'll just wait. I'll see if I can take a shower. Like, I didn't know if the shower system was working because in the desert, water is collected from when it rains. And it was December, so it is the rainy season. But I wasn't sure what had happened before I came. So I'm like, I'll just wait until I get there. So I'm at the airport and my driver's waiting for me outside, you know, holding a sign up for me. Um, and he's like, oh, are you ready? And I'm just like, yep. He's like, do you have snacks? And I'm like, it's not that far. And he just looks at me like, you're okay. He's like, can, actually, can you go buy me cigarettes? And I'm just like, I just left the security though. He's like, yeah, just go tell him it's for me. And he told me his name and I'm just like, I was a little bit cautious. I'm like, are you going to drive off without me? But... Go back into the airport, go buy cigarettes. I'm like, can I get um, a carton of, and he like wrote it down on a piece of paper. And it was in Arabic. I had no idea what he wrote. And they're just like, ah, for a rattle off his name. And I'm like, yep. And they're like, ah, have fun. And I'm just like, okay, well, apparently everyone knows everyone in this part of the world. So we get in his car and his car was the best car I've ever seen. And when I get a car, it's totally gonna be like this. So imagine getting into a car and all of the paneling on the inside being taken off. And then in there, there's tapestries and there's beads and there's decorations and there's just like everything so majestic in there. 100% gonna have a sparkle car when I get a car. So we're driving and we're driving and I kind of have to pee, I'm kind of thirsty, kind of hungry. And it's already been 20 minutes and I'm just like, I know we're going at least 120. We should have been there by now. And then I'm looking at the um, reservation that I booked and my communication with the host. They didn't write 15 kilometers. They wrote 150 kilometers. Yeah. Didn't write that very well. So I'm like, well, this is going to be interesting. So I'm in this car, and then we get stopped by the police a couple of times. One of the times, though, uh, the driver was a little bit scared. He's like, if they ask, you're my you're my new girlfriend, and you're from Canada, obviously, because that's your passport, but you don't have any money, you don't know any Arabic, and I'm taking you to see my brother. And then we're going to go see my parents. And I'm just like, okay, well, if that's what's going to get us by, I'm your new girlfriend, and we're going to go meet the family, and then... So the officers come over and they're like, who are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm his new girlfriend from Canada. And they look at me and they're like, oh. They ask for some sort of a currency. And I'm like, I don't have any currency. I was in Casablanca and got robbed. And they're just like, ah, oh, damn it. So also, not true, but that's what I said. And true, though, I didn't have any money. I didn't think to bring cash, which would haunt me later. But anyway. We get down and we're driving and we're driving. And as it got darker, we had to drive slower because on the desert roads in the middle of the Sahara, there's no lights. It gets dark. There's animals on the floor and you don't want to run into any of those. So we end up getting into the middle of this one place and it's like a meetup place. Um, and there's these two massive Jeeps next to us and we pull up and skid. 
and then there's some sort of an exchange, people hugging, and there's like a bunch of Berber people in the corner. They're like, ah, get in the Jeep. And I'm like, what? Get in the Jeep. We still have like 30 minutes to go. And I'm like, but I have to pee. And they're like, then go over there. And I'm just like, oh, okay, thank you. So I go over there in the darkness and I just pop a squat and pee, get in the Jeep. And they're like, welcome, how was the trip? And I'm just like, it was, it was fantastic. And I tell them the 15 to 150 kilometer mistake I made and they lose it. They're like, you're an idiot. So we get to the camp that I was staying at, you know, and they have dinner freshly prepared, some sort of a fresh stew with fresh rabbit and uh, tajine, yeah, tajine is the name. Some potatoes, some carrots, the best food of my life has been in the Sahara Desert. So we're in there, we're eating. Um, and then after that, after every meal, it's fire time. There's no, no rest in the Sahara. So we go around the fire and they're singing and they're beating drums and they're like, sing with us, sing with us. And I'm just like, can I sleep? I'm really, really tired. So I go into my little tent and I sleep and I sleep and I sleep and I slept like 10 a.m. the next day. They're like, where, what happened? You slept through all of the music, all of the wolves last night that were crying and it's now 10 a.m. Do you want food? And I'm like, no, I just want to sleep. And I told them the story of Casablanca. And they're like, oh, welcome to the Sahara. It's peaceful. So then I spent a bunch of time in the Sahara Desert, walking around, exploring. There was a couple of days where um, one of the people took me out on a camel. Like it was me and a camel, a camel named Lashkal. And me and Lashkal and Mohammed and we went and we camped in the desert for a couple of days. We saw the stars and he told me stories of the stars. And he could tell the weather by looking at the stars. I'm just like, how? How can you tell this? And he's like, oh, it's just part of our Berber tradition. His grandmother taught him, her grandmother taught her, and it had just been passed down. So for hours every night, he would just tell me these stories and tell stories of like how his, just, oh, it was so cool, just his family and how cool the desert is. So after we get back to the camp, um, I was just in some sort of a bliss. You know, I had just been in the desert with another stranger. You know, we were just making our own meals. Um, he would randomly go off sometimes in the day and he'd be like, oh, I see someone in the distance. I'm going to go buy bread from them. And I'm like, how? How do you see someone? There's no one in the distance. And he's like, oh, they're right there. It's very clear. You know, at night, we would try to catch baby foxes. So we wouldn't eat all the food we made because oh, we just didn't. But we left it for the foxes. And if we were very quiet, we could watch them actually eat the food. So we would make like a little fox trap and we would hide and try to see the fox. And it was kind of a game. Um... Anyway, we're walking back to uh, camp after we were done with the desert. And he's like, so how much longer are you going to stay? And I forgot how long I stayed there. Um, but the rest of my time in the camp, you know, there was a couple of other uh, Western tourists that came through. Um, and then, you know, I was just reading books, making stone. Like I was just stacking stones on top of each other to see what I could stack see what it would fall over, went for a bunch of walks in the desert, and it was just so peaceful, and I'm like, is this what Paulo Coelho found whenever he went down here in the desert, and whenever he wrote this book, is this peace and serenity and silence and simplicity of life what all of our souls are after, and what we should aspire to be, instead of this crazy life that is surrounding by busyness and by protecting the sheep and by getting income and by shearing the sheep and doing whatever. And sheep could be whatever in your life. Like it could be traffic, it could be your day-to-day -day job, it could be jumping on Zoom calls, it could be, you know, whatever it is. And I'm like, this is, it was so insightful. And then one day, um, one of the owners of the camp had a, had a brother. And their brother was quite younger than he was. One time. So the brother was quite younger. Um, probably low 20s. 
he had just finished university and he went to university in one of the bigger cities around and his English was pretty good. Um, he wanted to practice English. So he would come up to me all the time and just want to talk. And sometimes I was like, I just want to sit and stare at the wind. But I talked quite a lot to him. Um, so he went to university for hospitality and geography degrees, but he got really interested in technology when he was there. And my day job is in technology. So he wanted to learn more about what I did and, you know, the tech world. And I'm like, if you're so interested in technology, why don't you, you know, go to Casablanca, go get a, go get a job. There's a lot of tech companies there you could work for. And he's like, yeah, I'm thinking about it. But every time I leave the desert, I miss the desert. He told me that there was a time in university he got so depressed. He's like, I had friends. We were going out to clubs every night, we were partying. He's like, I was wearing Western clothes. But I missed the desert. I missed wearing the clothes I grew up wearing, like the traditional Berber clothes. And he's like, there's something about this that I like. It's never going to make me rich. But, and I can't, he couldn't describe it. And I can't describe it. And, you know, I talked to him and I'm just like, hey, if this is where your heart is, stay here. And he dreamed of going other places, like seeing Sweden, seeing the white foxes in the north of Sweden and seeing snow and stuff. And I'm like, you can still do that just because you're here. And just because this is where you find the most peace and serenity doesn't mean you can't go do any of that. So I hope that I was able to leave him with a little bit of hope. Uh, you can go see the rest of the world. It's there. And so if you are listening, the world is there. It's still here, waiting. Go check it out. But anyway, best time ever that I had in the Sahara Desert. So, yeah, Paulo Coelho decided that mission for me. Now, the other mission that Paulo Coelho decided for me, and it didn't go so well. So that was the uh, adventure in Morocco that Paulo Coelho decided for me. Now, what Paulo Coelho did not tell me was that coming back out of Morocco would be a pain in the butt. I booked a flight back, obviously, as you have to do. So I went from the tiny little airport that I flew into. So it was another, you know, very long taxi drive, but this time I was prepared. Plenty of water, plenty of snacks. Um, got to the airport and I met a, I met another woman at the airport. Uh, she was from, I think Austria. Yeah, I think she was from Austria. And I was like, how was it? Did you like it? And she's just like, no, I hated it. Everyone kept staring at me. And here I am with blue hair, you know, with all sorts of stuff. And I'm just like, well, yeah, we're white. We're Western. Like, we're, we don't belong here. It's why we stare at the camels and why we take photos of the city and stuff. It's different. And she had an entirely opposite experience that I did. And I'm just like, well, I hope you can go back sometime. And I hope that, like, when you go back, it's right for you. Because when the universe is ready to accept you into the desert, it's life-changing. So we talked, and it turned out that we were sitting next to each other on the tiny little airplane. And so we exchanged more travel stories and just, like, I don't know, solo travel women's stories. Super, super fun. So we land in Casablanca, and her flight was going direct to, probably to, like, Munich or something very close to Austria. And I was going back to London. Um, and the flight was a little bit delayed. And there was some something wrong with the airplane. Not loving flying myself, that's never a really good thing for me. So I get in the airplane. And it turned out great. Like, I booked the window seat because I like to look out the window. And if I want to fall asleep, I just fall asleep against the window. Makes sense. Logic. Science. And then there was another gentleman on the aisle seat. Perfect. Well, the last passenger to board, um, it was one of those passengers who you know should have booked two seats. And I was filled of so much empathy and so much compassion from leaving the desert. Then I looked at her and I'm just like, do you want the aisle? Like, I can, I can switch you. 
So she looks at me and she's like, yes, that'd be awesome. Now, usually, like, I, I've done this a couple of times before. And usually when you switch someone who's a little bit larger a seat, you know, they try to, um, you try to be small. Like, I try to be tiny when I'm on a plane because you have just someone next to you and you're just like sardines in a tin can. She had no desire to do that. So she sits in the other seat, puts up the armrest, and she's just like spread out as big as she can possibly make herself. And here I am in the middle seat and they start to bring up, up the food. She plops her plate, tra- bah, 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 English. She plops her tray down and it's not sitting on her lap. So she turns, puts mine down and puts her tray on my thing. And she's left-handed. We were sitting on the right-hand side of the plane. So every time she moves her elbow, it's just punching me in the boob, punching me in the boob. And the flight attendant hands me my meal. And I'm just like, what? Can't you see? Like, I'm being invaded by this person over here who but is clearly eating on my lap. And flight attendant had no sympathy for me. Well, hold it then until she's done. And then you can eat yours. And I'm just like, oh, my God. I held it. My arms got tired, and I'm just like, where's all of my Desert Apollo Coelho awesomeness in my life? So the guy next to me is, you know, just laughing at it. He can't, he doesn't want to do anything. He can't do anything. He could have, like, switched me half the flight or whatever. So we're about halfway through the flight, and I get up, and I'm just like, I, I can't stand this. You know, there's someone, I just can't, it's just not working for me. So I went to the only place I know how to go to the toilet. Now the toilet in an airplane is never clean and it's pretty gross. So I'm sitting in there and I'm like, damn it, I should have brought a book. Stay in the toilet for about 30 minutes and then they finally clear all the food trays out, which was nice. And I was like, oh yes, my next door neighbor is gonna have her tray up and maybe she'll put the armrest down. So at least there's some sort of a divider between us. Um, No, I don't think that armrest would have gone down. So I go back to my seat and I look at it and there's probably 10 centimeters. Now, I'm not big, but I'm not tiny. Like I need my whole seat to put all of my awesomeness in that seat. And there's no way I'm getting that seat. So I get up again and I just go walk in the galley area. Um, It was a massive plane and there was like two different big galleys in there. The flight attendants come to me you can't be here. Go sit down. And I'm like, I can't. Someone is sitting in my seat. Oh, kick them out. And I'm just like, I, I can't sit in this seat. She's too big. Well, you must sit in your seat. You paid for it. It's like some sort of aer- airline regulation rules. And I'm just like, yeah, I know, but I can't fit. And when this happens occasionally, flight attendants usually take someone and they put them in a place where there's more seats. So I asked, I'm like, oh, there's an empty seat over here. Can I move over here? I can sit here. No, you have to sit in your seat. And I'm just like, can you come and look at my seat? So they look at my seat. They look at the tiny gap and they're like, you can fit. Like, What happened to all the niceness? Be nice. And so I'm like, okay, can you just watch? And I'll show you I can't fit. And then we can try it again. So they see that I can't fit in the seat and they're like, okay, well, you must sit here for landing. You can go sit back there. So I go sit back and it was these two really nice ladies that I was sitting, like it was the middle seat that I was uh, sitting in with two other nice ladies. And they're just like, we're so sorry. (laughs) Do you need anything? And I'm just like, alcohol and a nap. And they just laugh. And, you know, we had neither, but it was just, it was hilarious. So... For landing, I never moved back to my seat. Um, I'm like, there's no way I'm gonna be able to buckle up there. And even if the plane crashes, I'm gonna be safer in a seat that I can buckle my seatbelt in instead of a seat where someone else is sitting on the seatbelt and everything else. So after we landed, this was part was really interesting. There was these little spray cans that the flight attendants came by with and they're like, now we must disinfect the plane. I don't know what it was, but it was the first time I've actually been in a plane that was disinfected like that. So I thought that was pretty cool. So they disinfect the plane and then I had to sit there for like 15 minutes and then we could proceed to our gate and then we could deboard our gate. Well, I get to passport control and my passport wouldn't go on the e-gate reader. So I have to go up to the counter and they're like, why did you go to Morocco? 
I'm just like, have you heard of Paulo Coelho? And the um, passport agent next to the person I was talking with was like, oh, I just read The Alchemist. And I'm like, now you know I went because of Paulo Coelho. I read The Alchemist and I knew I had to go into the Sahara to see what it was all about. And they're just like, how, how was it? How? And I'm, you have to go. I'm like, getting there is dreadful. That's the worst part. But once you're there, it's so worth being. There's so much peace. The people are so happy and so genuine. And you'll never see so many stars in the sky anywhere else in the world. So I have part two of this uh, letting Paulo Coelho pick my travels coming up next week. Um, let me know how you like this part. And if you're thinking about going to Morocco, I told you kind of a, a horror story of getting to Morocco, but 100% go. The tips I have for you if you go to Morocco. One, bring cash. Most places take credit card, but if you go into smaller places, then you're gonna need cash and it's better to have it beforehand than it is afterhand. Now, if you're coming from a Western country, you may need to actually order the cash in advance. I didn't know this when I was buying my cash when I was in London. So make sure you call the exchange agency first and order you know, whatever you need first before you go down there. Um, the other thing that I would say is just be prepared for anything. There's different rules in Morocco. It runs a little bit differently. I really enjoyed how calm and relaxing it was. Um, but as I said, my Austrian friend that I met hated it. So just be prepared for something different. The other thing I'll let you know about is the SIM card. So SIM card may not work in Morocco. If it doesn't work, just pop into one of the shops and just buy like a 10, whatever, 10 unit, 10 euro orange SIM card. So orange is the network that actually works in the Sahara. The other networks really don't work there. So I highly recommend orange, not sponsored by them, but in rural areas in North Africa and in Europe, orange is the network that I 100% always go to. Great signal. You may only get 3G, but 3G is all you need to get WhatsApp to run, and everyone there uses WhatsApp. And finally, the last tip, if you don't have it, download WhatsApp. Everyone uses it for calls, for texting, for whatever. So make sure you have that downloaded on your phone before you even take off to go to Morocco. So I hope you like, subscribe, tell friends about it. Thank you. And next time, oh, sparkles. Finally, we have sparkles today, you guys. Audio listeners, my video I record my podcast on has animations. And so far, we've had sparkles today, and we've had a random thumbs up that came sometime. So, yeah, thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for listening. And next week, we'll tell you about a story where Paulo Coelho put me in a really weird spot. So, yeah, stay tuned. Ciao. Balloons.